Cash speaks, people don't. That is what MSNBC host Dylan Radigan told me in this week's Office Politics. I spoke with Dylan about what is fueling the Occupy Wall Street movement, and I asked him what sparked it. You know, your guess is honestly as good as mine. My, my sense of it is this. It became apparent at the end of the Bush administration that we had a corrupt government to most people in this country. Uh, that was made Define corruption. Corruption meaning that there's platinum citizens, that there are financial, that there are institutions in the financial institutions that have control over our government that get treated differently than everybody else in America. There was as if there was tacit approval of that. No, Tim Geithner said there are two kinds of citizens, effectively. There are platinum citizens who have the rights of the too big to fail banking institutions to take as much money as they want out, to gamble as much as they want. And then there are, unfortunately, the non-platinum citizens, which are all the students with the student debt, which is all the unemployment in this country, which is all the retirees who are getting 0% interest because of policies advocated by Tim Geithner at the Treasury Department with the Federal Reserve Chief. And so you create that split, right? That is behavioral economics 101. This country, as a group of people, rejects outright breach of fairness almost more than anything else that we saw with the amendment to move the, the voting age to 18 in Vietnam. How can the kids, we can't have them fighting if they can't even vote? Well, we found ourselves in a final and yet another breach of fairness, which is platinum citizenship as advocated by Tim Geithner and his predecessors and everybody else. So the Tea Party shows up and they say, this is nonsense. We're not doing this. Now, the Tea Party, that energy, that upwelling of energy, that rejection of that unfairness rapidly became a political vehicle for all sorts of interests that had nothing to do with what the Tea Party started on. And you don't have to look any further than the Tea Party's refusal to actually engage the banks. And I'm sitting here as an anchor at MSNBC. I'm like, oh, man, when the bank reform comes, the Tea Party's going to be on their throats. There's no way they're going to be able to get away with this. Tea Nowhere. Nowhere. And so you get this first rejection of a Tea Party. Then you also have the Obama wave, which is Obama's going to fix. President Obama will fix this. Senator Obama will become president and he will fix this. Didn't happen. I believe the occupation is like the third wave. Think of it like sets of waves of energy or, or hands at a blackjack table. The origins of the occupation, which I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody will ever ultimately know, I think are less for me are less relevant than the energy of the rejection of unfairness that is being continued to be expressed either through the support of President Obama and his candidacy, which was the perception that that would get fix it, the emergence of the Tea Party before it was co-opted, and now uh, the Occupy movement, which honestly, that, if history is any indication, the Occupy movement won't go anywhere either, by the way, but you will continue to see waves of rejection of unfairness because the world is so transparent now that everybody can see it. Everybody knows the problem. The problem is our government is bought. The Democratic Party is bought. The Republican Party is bought. That's not an opinion. Remember, 94% of the time, this is, a this is a fact, 94% of the time, the candidate who raises the most money wins. That is well, not a democracy. That is an auction. So, so are you saying special interest is what happens when people raise that much money? They are beholden to these special interests? I mean, and it's, I mean, who, who is, who's the candidate out there speaking for all of those 99% down there in Occupy nobody, Wall Street? Nobody. Nobody. Absolutely nobody. Um, I also want to ask you about this photograph. Are you a surfer? What's the story uh, well, I'm, I, 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 am only, I, I am a paddleboarder, which I consider to be um, a way to surf if you can't surf. Uh, which is surfing? what I am. Oh, many times. I have, I have spent. Up? Oh, absolutely. The reason I end up getting up on a wave when I go surfing uh -huh. is to get back to the beach because right. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> it's so, so, you, so tiring, so isn't you it? So you paddle out. Your whole body you get aches. annihilated. The waves continue to work. Yeah. You. Eventually, you realize if I don't get back in, I'm going to drown out here, which gives you the proper motivation to surf back in. At which point, you then get on a wave and you're like, I hope to God this wave takes me back to the beach because I think I'm going to die. Um, and there's a certain point where that loses some of its entertainment value and so fortunately they innovated with the paddle boarding yeah. uh, which gives you a lot more control uh, and a lot it's just a lot easier to, to not get uh, destroyed by the waves. Coming up later at 1130 Eastern surfer Dude Dillon is going to tell us why the folks in Washington have it all wrong about the economy.